Each of you has a customer. No matter what you're delivering, if you're delivering a financial report as, an, uh, as a financial analyst, or if you're putting numbers into the system as an accounts payable person, you have a customer. You, the reason you're here is you're delivering something to somebody. Putting the structures into place to deliver data in a way that helps make a decision is the art behind financing. Here's the relationship that data has to what we're trying to do. Here's the knowledge in context that we're trying to use that data for, but ultimately you're trying to make a decision with the data. And most finance areas, most finance, comp most finance departments fall short in this. They're still learning this today. If this is the end in mind that you're looking for to give to a general manager or a product line or a business unit leader, you're trying to deliver this so you can make decisions, how do you deliver that? How you deliver that is hard. This looks pretty, but getting the information to feed that takes design and it takes an understanding of what it is you're trying to deliver. Your product is data. And when your product is data, what you're really trying to do with that data is deliver information and then ultimately knowledge about that data so you can make a decision. Everything starts and ends with your customer. Know your customer inside and out. Uh, know what they're doing, why they're doing it, why they're not doing it. Design your company and your product around your customer and you'll be great. A mistake I see a lot of entrepreneurs make is they just go crazy talking to anyone that will listen to them, wasting their time talking to someone who, if they had just asked a few qualifying questions, they would have known early on, and eh, my chances are pretty small. Getting creative about the problems that you're facing in each stage, to me, is the essence of being a great entrepreneur. If you look at what an early stage venture goes through compared to a late stage, the problems are different, but if you have a great approach to involving your team in how to address the problems in a creative and, and well thought out way, then solving those problems get you onto the next stage, and I think that's how growth occurs in a great company. And so by asking questions at the various stage in the life cycle of your company, you can quickly eliminate with a phone call, not even have to go pitch an investor who clearly is over here in the later stage and you're trying to get money over here in the early stage. You can turn off investors by having a price that is just out of whack with what they've seen in their portfolio and what the actual risks are. Um, the real risk for any startup, especially early on, is, is death that isn't um, giving up too much equity. The right investor for you depends on who you get along with personally. Um, it's someone who has expertise in what you're doing. Um, someone who can have your back, someone who can also challenge you. But as you start to grow, you actually have to grow into a manager. And that's something that we see a lot of founders haven't had much experience with before. And finding the right person who knows your field and can also help you grow into that is really, really powerful. And we change the problem space, you change the business model. Right? And you go from selling scarcity to, to a business model layered on abundance. That transition we're now seeing across all of these technologies, biotech, robotics, AI, 3D printing. And the ripple effects are incredibly profound because each technology is accelerating in its own right. And so when you look at all of these domains transitioning to a digital software-based, information-based environment, it fundamentally changes business. And if you're doing a startup, your product or service should be minimum 10x better than the marketplace. Otherwise, it's too hard to get traction. If you're 1x better or 2x better, the incumbents will kill you. Uh, they're better known. They can, they, can, they can innovate at an incremental level. But very few existing organizations can innovate to a 10x level. I think we're going to see the end of the category of the large corporation over the next decade or two. Um, uh, and so I think the, to all of the advantage is now with startups uh, because you have access to accelerating technologies, the cost is low, um, and you can think boldly. You can take on risks that any big company can't take on. When you're building a business, you worry about cost of supply and cost of demand, right? And how do you optimize on both sides of that equation, hopefully on the right side of the ledger. Um, the internet for the first time allowed us to drop the cost of demand exponentially. Uh, online marketing, referral marketing. If you get a viral loop, your acquisition costs go completely to zero. Uh, and that was actually the first time in business that you could acquire customers at no cost. We'd never been able to do that before. What these new exponential organizations have figured out is how do you drop the cost of supply exponentially? And when you can drop your cost of supply, you take out the denominator, your market cap explodes. 
And that's why these companies are doing so well. Uh, all of our existing businesses from many thousands of years is, have been about selling scarcity. You get uh, an asset or a workforce or some intellectual property, you put a legal boundary around it and you sell access to scarcity. And what many of you are doing is rather than selling access to scarcity, you're tapping into abundance. And many of these exponential organizations are tapping into an abundance of extra spare bedrooms lying around or an abundance of latent car usage because cars sit around empty. And so selling abundance and business models around abundance is what the new paradigm is.